don't say third episode, that might mean that we're committed to releasing ones we've already recorded, which we might in retrospect not want to release. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, the currently the third, but perhaps the first or even second episode okay. of Estranged. And mm-hmm. Adrian, what is Estranged? Please tell everybody. <laughs> well, it's kind of, uh, we've talked about um, the sort of ruptures that are apparent in some of the films that are within ideology. Mm-hmm. And you start to see these cracks that lead you towards being able to critique ideology. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things. I mean, obviously, it's also a Marxist uh, concept of being estranged through labor. And yeah. I think that maybe that's something that that uh, millennials especially are, yes. which we are. Which we are, are proudly are really so. experiencing the estrangement from, from themselves. Yeah, and I almost feel like in recent years, a coming to realization of being estranged in that uh, coming to a certain age and point in one's life where th- certain things that one assumed would be possibilities certainly aren't yep. certain economic recoveries that we might have expected by now haven't occurred for various reasons and also something that we might go into later you know how this has come about how the papering over the failures of capitalism have happened in this kind of neoliberal age with things like loans and credit cards etc 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 and some of us aren't even aware of our own uh economic imprisonment um yeah. because capitalism is very clever at hiding itself from us at making it at presenting itself as inevitable mm. as inevitable well well that's a whole other thing yes that we it's almost kind of as if there's no ideology in this kind of part of the world that we live in and it's just this inevitable result of a human quote-unquote selfishness or the selfish mm. gene or how humans are motivated or it's some kind of biological inevitability um, but, yeah, so we're looking at how certain forms of art, most importantly film, can help us see our own ideologies at play. Mm-hmm. And uh, we think it's an important moment to be talking about this. And we think that a certain, I don't want to say healing, but kind of improvement of our own situation can come about just by being aware some kind of progression mm, i don't know progression becoming <laughs> maybe pro- progress yeah it's funny the word progression because there's a progressive politics is a is a um is no a not progressive thing. just like just pure progression as Could in be- as in continual yeah, exactly. emergence becoming yeah i don't know if it's yeah it's in it's, it's the same with psychoanalysis is one ever cured what is the cure but just some being a it's Marx kind of part of his insight is just being aware of the chains that one's in. Yeah. Allows change to happen and it's important to be aware of the kind of powers at play. I would describe it sort of like as a non teleological progress. Mm-hmm. Okay. It doesn't have yeah. some kind of like end point to the absolute yeah. end yeah. or anything like that. Something to hope for, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. It's just progress for the sake of progress yeah. and we we do like a bit of cameo on this podcast <laughs> yeah. we um it's funny this is something that I, I i get on my high horse about but there's one particular um figure who has emerged in contemporary culture um as kind of a response to progressive politics as an alternative to namely uh jordan peterson oh and God. he is somebody who talks about it was funny because um well This is a huge other topic that we could get into and could dedicate a whole billion series onto this topic. I find (laughs) it so so fascinating and him so fascinating and what is correct in what he's saying, what's very wrong in what he's saying. But um, something that he seems to be keen on is uh, precision. Mm -hmm. But he's very imprecise when it comes to Camus and when it comes to existentialism. He calls himself an existentialist and... I beg to differ. But he confuses Camus and Nietzsche all the time. Okay. Yes, I have listened to a lot of his YouTube um, seminars because uh, Peter was planning a talk about John Peterson, so he gave a lot of time to listening to his Which is pretty good. I like that. We listened to a lot of... Oh, Peter's talk. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I do really like it. I haven't listened to a lot of Peterson. You know what I do listen Mm -hmm. to? His Q&As that he does for his podcast. 
they're just oh, wow. very oh, so like, people like people send them questions yeah. uh angry mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. men yeah i think maybe some women also yeah. also answer like yeah. write questions about what they can yeah. do with their mm -hmm. lives yeah. and you know he basically tells them to plan their future yeah to have goals Order, to clean to their chaos, rooms yeah. to stand up straight to be more like lobsters Whatever that means. Well, this is this is a funny topic actually, the lobster, because we were going to talk about this as one of our lists before we get into today's into today's film uh, about about the difference between animals and humans, mm -hmm. and that difference is language and uh, drive versus instinct. And so, to compare humans to animals to a lobster is very strange because we are completely different beings yeah. by definition aka also why human asian why humanism mm. just doesn't yeah well, is not a thing we're not humanist humanists here i'm afraid yeah and it's funny because it's, 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 it's always like something like a delicate a delicate difference but a profound difference in that you know that there, there is no answer there's no way of being that's going to make your life better or coming to understanding the kind of chemicals in your brain and uh, I mean, maybe sort of, but not in a great existential sense. Which is maybe the only thing we have in common with animals. That there is no final answer. I mean, yeah. you don't see dogs looking for like the final answer, right? Yeah, Some well, they, they, don't have, they don't have the sense of lack that we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the Jordan Peterson thing is, is very interesting. And um, I think a lot of people stumble upon him because they have, they don't have an answer and they kind of, feel perhaps that a lot of answers that are being thrown at them aren't right aren't appropriate and they kind of sense that they're wrong and we'll talk about a lot in this podcast about capitalist ideology and how it relates to progressivism how it relates to identity politics how it relates to how certain forms of social justice have been co-opted and how that's not necessarily a good thing and does disservice to social justice etc um but yeah there, there is something there is something profoundly wrong um, and profoundly wrong for a lot of people. And Jordan Peterson provides an answer that to me seems just like the Dunning-Kruger effect in action. Mm -hmm. As in, um, it's interesting, he talks about this phenomenon, uh, cultural Marxism, which I'm not quite sure really... I mean, I understand what he's saying, but I, to me it just doesn't exist. And actually the thinkers that he's thinking about are profoundly against the kind of forms of uh, the ways in which they have been co-opted by secondary and tertiary thinkers a lot in the United States and the United Kingdom, potentially in the university realm, and that the original yeah, the texts yeah. say the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like Jordan Peterson has built his whole career out of hearsay, out of hearsay, out of hearsay, out of an original text that says something completely different. What is his basic thing that he says that Marxists are sort of like taking over the academic world? Yeah, something and like, like, I think that like this, the cultural Marxism is that it's this planned thing that happened with the Frankfurt School when they realized, yeah, it's like a conspiracy theory that they realized that they weren't going to win economically. So a way that they could infiltrate the West was to gradually enter into the academic realm and then break down the whole basis of society but I mean it's funny because this is based on like some sort of vague misunderstandings of a lot of these continental thinkers you know and you have a lot of a lot of them thinkers as well change their perspectives throughout the whole you know work early Freud is quite different to late Freud late Freud is quite con conservative and I think Jordan Peterson might find a lot of things if he read the original text I'm not sure if he has or hasn't that he would agree with and wouldn't feel the need to fight against. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this, it's funny. This, it's, uh, um, he, he has cites a lot of this book by Stephen Hicks. Which, interesting love, enough, cites uh, Kant she says and Kant Hegel is, yeah, as, as postmodern. Or they say that Kant's an anti-enlightenment thinker and all this kind of thing. And it's like, yeah. I think somebody should just read the original text. Um, yeah, but it's funny because a lot of... Uh, I mean, where can we? Where do we start with the how? How a lot of these original thinkers have been completely co-opted wrongly, often in academic circles. How, um, and I don't know. There could be many explanations for it, but universities are becoming very corporatist. Mm -hmm. um, with you know, it's, it's they're funding based students are now clients, um, 
and I don't know if one can well we will talk about this at, at length throughout the podcast and maybe gradually just yeah. drip these ideas because they quite sound potentially quite confrontational when you just say them as a statement without mm-hmm. doing a lot of groundwork first but a lot of these ideas have been co-op, co-opted by capitalism and by corporatism and that in order to toe the line and keep one's job one must maintain a certain ideological perspective which isn't what the original thinkers said yeah and he especially like misreads uh, Nietzsche I think yeah that's one of the things but I mean I don't know he said that he's read Nietzsche mm-hmm. like directly mm-hmm but I don't know if the way that he understands Nietzsche is like through Hicks. I know, I exactly. There's a lot of, as a, yeah, there's a lot of kind of a certain part. And obviously we take our own interpretations from everything we read. We project our own thoughts and our own experience into what we read. And that yeah. is just it's something that happens. But the, yeah, it's just it's the, 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 the precision thing is something that I find a bit difficult to stomach, given that there's a lot of misquotation and... I don't. I don't know much about a lot of things, but I have an interest in existentialism and psychoanalysis. And mm-hmm. when he calls himself a psychoanalyst, um, well, it, it, has he done the training? Just because you have an interest in psychoanalysis doesn't no, mean that I don't you think to... psychoanalysis, but some kind of psychology. Yeah, I mean, he's a clinical psychologist. Yeah, um, but it's, it's, it's a very not different the same thing. thing. And I think I think he has an interest, or he's he's often been on shared stage with people who are. Um, evolutionary psychologists, which might um, but I heard, suggest why he refers to lobsters. I don't yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I heard that even Jungians don't particularly like him. Well, yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, is like Jung is also a very complex figure, and early Jung and late Jung, and there's, there's a whole array of perspectives. I had an interest in Jung for a long time when I was a lot younger and I can see certain correct readings as I can say it of Jung but I think a lot of people who are experts in certain fields when there is an encroachment of Jordan Peterson into their realm they suddenly realize oh no and I have a lot of friends who kind of liked him in early 2016 well I guess he emerged kind of late 2016 and then gradually when he's talked about certain things like I have a lot of friends who are interested in health and he'll talk about a health topic and then it'll be like, oh, hang on, what? No, and it's a kind of an absolute yeah. certainty of, with which he speaks is, yeah, kind yeah. of interesting. I, yeah, uh, you know you know who's getting into like this kind of Jungian thing? Mm-hmm. My dad, he's been listening. Really? He's been like reading Scott Peckman mm-hmm. and uh, James Hillman. Oh, I think right, that- yes, Hillman I get talked, told to read a lot and I have never read him, but yeah. Well, they're they're Jungian guys, yeah. and I think that their main thing is just sort of like uh, the unconscious being compensatory mm-hmm, yes. for archetypes that you can sort of uh, mm-hmm. perform in your own life mm-hmm. and or or bring out, I mm-hmm, guess, mm-hmm. from from from. Like, I I get the idea that maybe for Jung, there's like these certain components that maybe yeah. are asleep that you need to find balance into. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's something that we would from the position of this podcast not agree with is this kind of balanced compensatory mechanism i guess that's the difference really um yeah the unconscious as a crack rather than that it doesn't even exist anywhere below that is just within within the world Mm -hmm. um rather than a kind of compensatory mechanism a subconscious or some kind of all-knowing power that we just have to listen to and then I mean, the funny thing is, is, you know, again, there are, so we humans repress. So I guess there is some kind of topological um, dimension to repression that comes out automatically. You know, that's a kind of a pushing down and there's an underneathness. And of course, symptoms can be listened to and symptoms often ar- um, arise in the body because of certain things that we're not paying attention to in our own lives. But it's a general rule, Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the idea that there's a compensatory mechanism is not something. I I personally, having been a Jungian, I don't think it works, but that's just my own yeah. perspective having gone yeah, through well, that. I mean, if you're really into compensation, mm-hmm. I think that most likely it will happen that you won't you won't come to terms with the function of your own repression. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that you can not repress, Yeah, but covering over it even more because repression is a 
form of covering up. So it's like yeah. covering the covering. Yeah. That I think that eventually can bring some kind of, uh, maybe some kind of break. Yeah. Some kind of psychic break in, in, in the future. I mean, you, you've talked to me a little bit about that. You know, you used to kind of like young when you were younger and mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like a very happy moment. No, I think, um, this is another thing that about humans when, um, you know, the, the notion of happiness is quite an interesting one. Like what is happiness? Do we even know when we're happy? A lot of people mistake happiness for an attempt to be happy. Yeah. So when I was a... The pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of yeah. happiness. When I was a Jungian, I kind of had this like... Des- I, was, I, I was becoming happy. I was going to therapy and I was finding out about myself and I was going... I was working towards being happy and I had all these goals and by dint of pursuing them, I felt like I was happy. But in retrospect, I was profoundly, profoundly depressed. Yeah. And I think a lot of people mistake the action of believing that there is a happiness out there in the future and taking steps towards that mm-hmm. is happiness rather than just being and being happy. And no wonder that Jordan Peterson likes religion a lot. Mm. Because religion functions in that exact same yeah. way with yeah. the, I mean what we're talking about just mm-hmm. like the it is very teleological. Yeah. Everything is pointing towards yeah. some sublime mm-hmm. end of mm-hmm. balance mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm not sure if necessarily something like a utopia mm-hmm. but definitely some kind of higher yeah. consciousness yeah. where people become aware of themselves yeah. deep yeah. deeply but I'm not sure that that can even happen and yeah. certainly not through ignoring the the mechanisms of yeah. repression it's funny because yeah I think yeah happiness exists better things can exist moments of kind of real feeling at one with whatever this world is can exist but almost in order to be able to permit that to be an experience in our lives we have to accept that it doesn't sure and so this is why progressive politics is something that it it doesn't have interest for me because i feel like no, no change can be made until we accept that there is nothing but the here and now, the grit and grime of the world that we live in mm-hmm. now. And you will always have scapegoat mechanisms, whatever group is scapegoated at any given time, if we believe that as long as something changes, something else can yep. can happen. Absolutely. And it's funny because this is something we're going to talk about today uh, in terms of the film that we looked at for this episode, which is a film by Pedro Almodovar called Live Flesh. And there's various reasons why we decided to do this film rather than any number of his other incredible films. Mm -hmm. Which maybe we'll do in the future. Yeah, which maybe we'll do in the future. um, Because this film is kind of unique for various reasons. It is his only film really about... Well, I actually don't want to say that. One of my friends said, oh, it's it's interesting you chose that. It's the only film about men, but it's not actually. He has plenty of films about men. I Um, didn't... Yeah, I didn't think it was about men. Because actually... You know, like Malade Cathion is about men, and anyway, but yet yeah, so his mm. most conventional film. It's based on a Ruth Rendell thriller, so yeah. it's a uh, it's a thriller, but it's Almodovar's take on a thriller. And the reason why I kind of segued from what we were talking about into introducing the film is Almod Almodovar's work comes out of a moment when change was necessary in Spain under Franco. Certain negative pro- uh, repressions. Uh, very conservative time and he has this kind of explosive energy in his work that's a rebellion against that the film the film starts by saying that there's a state of emergency mm-hmm. and that there's yeah. a suspension of human rights and, mm-hmm. and all that no? yeah and absolutely and when we say we're not into progressive politics we're not against it either it's just that at different times kind of certain rebellions are necessary against the contemporary situation and Almost what is happening in our world at the moment requires a different response. It requires resignation. Yeah, it requires a resignation, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Whereas Almodovar's films are almost the opposite. They're full of kind of life, very carnivalesque. As you were saying, I thought it was quite interesting, very hysteric, very explosive, introducing things that at the time were very um, yeah. taboo. Yeah, I, people you often describe him as a, a filmmaker that tells stories of women. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure that that's the thing. I think no. that he's a filmmaker of hysteria. Yeah, it's interesting because 
there's a lot of films at the moment about, well, I don't know if there are f- any more than there used to be, but, you know, this idea of a strong female lead. Mm. Um, it's kind of commodification of, within the Hollywood system, of a certain protest that was very necessary a certain period of time ago, but now has become kind of this fantastical, um, pleasurable thing that we like to see that leads us to forget the necessity of change in our own life, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. So there's been a real commodification over recent years. We see it in adverts. It's almost as soon as something's mentioned in an advert, advert is like pure ideology. It's like, okay, this has been co-opted by capitalism. So the protest culture within adverts. um, It's actually interesting. Recently in the UK, they banned this trope, but I was in the cinema last year and every single ad before the film was about how stupid men were and how a woman had to come and save the day. But they've actually made that trope illegal because it's just so, you know, Mm. stereotypical. Um, And I think an example, you know, we're talking about women as this kind of arbitrary choice. So we have a woman now in this film, this makes us um, a legitimate, better product than something else is this film what men want that came out (laughs) that i haven't seen it so i'm not an expert but the first film the nancy myers film a female writer director you know okay so so backwards you know it's based on freud's last question what do women want this kind of total enigma so for freud women are these incredibly complex beings Mm. But it's almost now we've tri- we've turned everything into tropes, and as long as we have this figure of a woman, right, tick, we've done this. And something I do like about um, Almodovar is the women in his films are very complicated and messy and it's dark. It's an open question. Yeah. An open question, yeah. They have horrible characters and funny characters and crazy characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I think that maybe what we talked about there, there being two kinds of films. I think definitely his. Films are representing ideology, not mm-hmm. within. Yeah, absolutely. I think that maybe he represents hysteria as unanswerable mm-hmm. as it should be, mm-hmm. and yeah. Yeah, no, it's so so interesting because, um, well, we've talked a lot about, or we will talk a lot about, the difference between kind of sixty-eight liberalism and um, contemporary liberalism. Mm-hmm. But Zizek talks a lot a lot about um, how. In the kind of 60s sexual revolution, the idea was that perversion, to be perverse, was to be the ultimate anti-capitalist subject. But for, um, Zizek is almost saying something completely different. He's saying that the, the hysteric position is to be. Yeah. And as you say, it's like this the unanswerable question. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard him often say that the political project of the present should be to rehabilitate hysteria. Mm-hmm. And I think that what he's getting at is... You know, because hysteria comes from this this Freudian thing of like women that used to think that they had like an extra and maybe an itch that wasn't there or mm-hmm. some kind of extra body part mm-hmm. that they felt like was there, but obviously mm-hmm. it wasn't. So the possibility of being able to formulate a question that is not already answered by capitalism. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we're living in a perpetual question yeah. rather than having some ultimate response that we're sure of that we are going to blindly uh pursue yeah and as we say so in even though this the live flesh is not necessarily a film about hysteria per se it does have a lot of um al mordovar's characteristic car use of color and music and kind of a slight absurdity and humor mm-hmm. uh it is his possibly his most conventional film but i just i just have seen this film so many hundreds of times yeah. <laughs> as a as a teenager is a bit obsessed with our modeva i have mm. to say and i feel like um i wouldn't be a filmmaker without you showed me the trailer the you showed me the trailer for atame yeah that i thought was really funny oh i mean at least God, the trailer really i really film. have to see that it is such a brilliant but we have to do an, an episode about it. it's hilarious and one of antonio banderas's mm-hmm. first films he plays like a lunatic asylum escapee who kind of captures an actress and <laughs> takes her hostage um, yeah, they're just they're just so vibrant and so brilliant and so funny, and oh, yeah, I'm very also very. I think he he shows you things that are not meant to see, mm-hmm. yeah, that are, are not meant to be seen mm-hmm. in in films. Like, well, no, you know what? I'll 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 save this for when we're already within okay. the movie. But 
Yeah. Yeah. You want to give like a quick rundown of the of the movie? So the movie is it's based on a Ruth Rendell mystery, so it's a kind of um a conventional thriller. And it starts off with a junkie who's actually from a very wealthy background. Um who Well do you want to do you want to explain the beginning about how yeah. she and Victor meet and how David and everything? Well, I would like to say also that Penelope Cruz has she's oh, she pregnant. pregnant. Yeah, yeah. She's pregnant. Uh, it starts with this whole this whole like state of emergency mm-hmm. message that is saying that certain rights of of civilians are suspended because there's you know that something's going on there politically, and um, Penelope Cruz is giving birth or is about to give birth. So they get into this bus, mm-hmm. and Victor is born on the bus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's very funny because they, they say like it's like the baby that's born on wheels. So <laughs> <laughs> what the state does is that they give him and yeah. his mother like free bus, bus rides bus. for life. <laughs> yes. And then and then I think maybe it's like we don't see him again until he's Yeah, like, so that's like kind of the prologue. Um yeah. and then his mother dies. So Victor, how does he come to meet Elena? He brings a pizza to her because mm-hmm. they had a quick one night stand mm-hmm. one day yeah. uh, that she doesn't seem to remember. Yeah. But she tells him that, you know, like let's we'll have a date this other yeah. day. So he's looking for her, but uh she says no. She mm-hmm. cancels on him. He's pretty upset, but he sees her through a window mm-hmm. and then makes his way into into the, the building. Body, yeah. And uh yeah, they have some kind of altercation there and a gun is shot and uh you remember that? Yeah. yeah. So this is where David comes in, who is a police officer. He's, he and it's kind of, the reason why I find it hard to explain is it's like a very <laughs> detailed, like love. How many, one, two, is it five characters? Who are in this like love? Six. Six. Including Hex- Sancho. Okay. Yeah. It's like six, Hex- is it six of them? So Victor, Elena, David, Sancho. And Clara. Like, yes, there's five. It's just a love pentagon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to, like, work out what what the best way is to, like, explain <laughs> who is with who. Um, no, so David and Sancho sure, are... Uh, like, are, patrolling. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're policemen that yeah. are working together. Yes. And it's interesting because David mm-hmm. is sleeping with Sancho's wife. wife Clara. Clara. Yes. But you don't know this until later. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of intimated maybe in certain glances early on. Yeah, yeah. but Sancho knows yeah. that David is is sleeping with, with, his, yeah. with his wife. So anyway, they make themselves... A gun a gun is is shot and somebody calls the police, mm-hmm. so it's them. Yeah, they go up, up. Yeah. And Victor and Elena are fighting. Yeah. Something happens, like he grabs, he grabs her as hostage when yeah. the police arrives. Yes. And then... It, then basically fighting. there's there's an accidental shot exactly and um david who is javier bardem who we just of course well i don't know about you but <laughs> 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 obviously love um is shot by oh you know he's great at yeah he's just, yeah. Uh, this is i think it's the last film i don't know if i should say why the reason why but <laughs> on the grapevine i've heard that there's a certain reason why he was never in a mold of our film again to do with uh a lot of are really fancying him. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. he's shot by Victor, mm-hmm. although he's not really, and he ends up with in a wheelchair. Victor is in prison. Da- David and Elena get together. He becomes this very, very successful wheelchair basketball star, which is hilarious when he when Victor sees that on uh, the television on the prison. television in jail. Yeah, yeah, um, and. So Victor obviously feels a lot of resentment because he's kind of this poor guy who has nothing. His mother dies when he's in prison. He has nothing. And this kind of girl who is, you know, this messed up kind of junkie, which from a wealthy family is with, totally cleaned up her act. And she's with this guy, David, who is in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And so Victor leaves prison. Yeah. And? He's very insulted that his first time having sex was with Elena. Yeah. But Elena tells him that, uh, you know, he didn't really know how to make love yeah, very well. Yeah. So he gets out of jail with this drive to be the best lover in the world. Yes. So <laughs> so he meets with, uh, interesting love, Clara. Yeah. They who meet. is Sancho's 
why exactly and, and they meet coincidentally and then they, they fancy each other mm -hmm. and then they start sleeping together mm -hmm. right and then clara like clara doesn't like the way that that victor makes love so victor's like you you need to show me give me lessons and mm -hmm. all that so like i don't know she she gives she, him something she, she, she like does. 11 or 12 lessons or whatever and he actually becomes very good yeah and then he wants to exact revenge on yes. elena by sleeping with her and mm -hmm. then having her beg him to to stay, stay with her yeah. or whatever and then he would be like no and just like never he would never yes. she would never see him again so elena is this wealthy woman who is kind of a philanthropist lady who runs who kind of donates money to a um, nursery for like orphans mm -hmm. and victor gets a job there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and then that's how they kind of meet and he kind of woos her yeah. and then they sleep together obviously they have this kind of explosive love affair and then what happens which you think is kind of unrealistic but we can talk about later what i think is that what i think is that elena ends up with david and but david was sleeping with clara mm -hmm. and i think that clara gives victor lessons mm -hmm. Of how to be a good lover based on what uh, David yeah. was the way that he used to make love yeah. before he got before he was handicapped. Yeah. So I think that the reason why Elena wants to have sex with Victor mm -hmm. is because he makes love the way that David doesn't anymore mm -hmm. because he's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that people in wheelchairs can't. Uh, make love right but it's a very obviously... explicit sex scene between Elena and David when he's in a wheelchair <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah no but um but the, obviously there's yeah. some kind of disadvantage there yeah, that needs yeah. to be taken into account so yeah. I think that I mean Elena knows that they slept together so maybe he I don't know she might be curious about yeah that, exactly I yeah. no I think it's a that I hadn't thought about that's a really interesting point this kind of this uh, this trail of David's sexual prowess sure it kind of ends up Elena getting it again <laughs> yeah. through David. And how does the film end? The film ends with, very unrealistically, I think, mm -hmm. with Elena and Victor getting married, mm -hmm. having kids and having a family and everything mm -hmm. and just like happily ever after. Yeah. Um, I also wonder, I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the fact that the working class guy yeah. in the whole movie is Victor. Yeah. Like he, you know, he wasn't jailed. He has a job at mm -hmm. this at this place thing, but it doesn't seem like he has a very high end job or mm -hmm. anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's an orphanage, but mm -hmm. um, and he's also he he also lives in this house that is scheduled for demolition. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so, so he doesn't really belong anywhere. Yeah. He was even born not in a hospital. He yeah, was born in this kind of mobile, bus, like the yeah. bus, and yeah, yeah, no, no place. He doesn't belong. Yeah. He doesn't belong. It's interesting because we were talking before about the difference between like 68 liberalism and contemporary liberalism and almost the response that Almodovar seems to have in his films to the contempt to the situation in which he grew up mm -hmm. is different to how it is today so we have this kind of there's almost like a buildings roman of this down and out working class kid who becomes the husband of this wealthy lady and the ending of the film is similar to the beginning in that Elena is giving birth almost in a car yeah in this world now in kind of the late 90s that is open post franco that all these things that have been fought for through the kind of 68 liberalism has been achieved and so like freedom so it's almost like a happy ending you know yeah. in that sense sure and it kind of is you know in terms of like the difference between what we're saying like resignation versus pursuit of some actual change mm -hmm. It, all of that stuff was necessary at that time in Spain. Yeah. Under kind of this conservative dictator. Yeah. So that's potentially why there's kind of a more positive ending and it kind of ends up together. But I feel like that's the ideology. That's You, you were saying it, it doesn't ring true and that's possibly the, like, the thing that's yeah, well, in the ideological sense that, in the film. Well, yeah, well, when Elena gets what she wants, mm -hmm. which is the ultimate... Uh, uh, it's the ultimate night of having sex with mm -hmm. Victor. Like, I think that that would have immediately slung her back to mm -hmm. to wanting to be with David mm -hmm. more deeply. Mm -hmm. Isn't that isn't that something that, that I've heard Peter say this a few times that it's just like you can have a couple 
the man has a mistress, wants the relationship to end so that he can be with the mistress. Mm -hmm. And then once the wife finds out, Mm -hmm. the mistress also disappears. Mm -hmm. Like the the injunction that comes from being with somebody and and not being able to be with somebody else, that's precisely why, that's what creates desire for Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. breaking that injunction. But once, once that's taken away... There's, you know, I, really I agree no with you. I agree with you. And I think, you know, again, we're not saying that every relationship is formulated like that, but a kind mm. of generally human desire is kind of formulated like that. Common. It is common. Yeah. But I think the thing is that in terms of the res- cultural response to the moment, Almodovar is potentially more within an early liberalism in that it kind of has to have a happy ending, but based on the kind of like the premise of the film and the early start, the, you know, starting and kind of like... 60s Franco Spain and emerging in like 90 or like it might have even been 70s I don't know 80s and emerging in kind of like a better world so this kind of like negative thing of like it's almost like there is a solution yeah you know it is teleological it It is teleological and um, potentially we're kind of saying that the response the necessary response if that film was made today in a country like the US sure yeah the response should be something different so we're not saying like throw 68 out mm-hmm. the sexual revolution but and it's we'll just talk- it's not something that is compatible with our times yeah it's not something that it has already been co-opted into capitalism and exactly. something different needs to emerge That's so we've been talking good. a lot yeah. about millennials and by the way don't you think that uh, just a quick aside, yeah. like don't you think that there should be a new philosopher because nietzsche like famously said that you know god is dead mm-hmm. don't you think that there should be a new philosopher that should say that teleology is dead well yeah i Cause mean because you, you have like this thing like the belief in god mm-hmm. like god can stop stop like people can stop believing mm-hmm. in god mm-hmm. But they still keep on believing. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, the promise we're be, of God. We're like going to be talking about um, hereditary, I think, mm-hmm. and the idea of ghost stories. And there is a saying, and I don't like Zizek's very good at like making up sayings. <laughs> but he said, he says, you know, you don't have to believe in God, ghosts to be afraid of them. Yeah. And this is, you know, like horror stories almost work in that way for us. That even though God is dead or ghosts don't exist and we consciously know it unconsciously we still believe yeah um it's almost too painful to admit the nothingness of everything so you keep the kernel so you of, keep uh, the kernel teleology, of, yeah. yeah it's interesting one of the great american novels that is a great novel is the great gatsby mm. and there's loads of uh different interpretations of the book and obviously it's it's kind of premonition of the Wall Street crash written in the ni- early 20s. And, you know, it's kind of a, one could say, a critique of the American dream. On the other hand, one could also say that the you have these different classes of people. You have the working class woman, Myrtle, who is plowed, plowed by uh, Gatsby's car, driven by Daisy, face first she's the working class person she's killed face first the kind of upstart middle class guy who's crawled his way to the top Gatsby is shot in the back and then the then the Daisy and Tom who are these like very careless carefree rich people just wander off so that kind of is saying you know that capitalism is horrible look that we plow down these poor people and they face it they are the ones that face the horror of the of the system the middle class people are kind of also shat upon but they're like (laughs) they're not quite aware of it and then you know the rich people flee i also have heard another um interpretation which is that and interestingly this academic i can't remember her name has is a professor of american literature in the uk and she has um been called upon quite a lot to give her opinion on brexit and she is very much you know the liberal position she believes that the novel is a novel of hope, that we have to believe, we have to hope. The great thing about America is that it's hopeful yeah. and that Gatsby dies happy because he's reaching out to the green light and he doesn't see that he is being shot. He doesn't know he's shot. He dies happy, he reaches out, he still believes. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that she's like this liberal talking head now in the UK. Yeah. So we're kind of saying that that hope has to be dissolved in our contemporary situation 
in yeah. order for change to happen. There's interesting in 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 Life Flesh. There's a part where David and Victor are fighting. Mm -hmm. They're like they they. I mean they they obviously are, more. I think David hates Victor because mm -hmm. he misunderstands. Like he he didn't shoot the gun or anything, mm -hmm. but there's this really funny part where they're like in the ground fighting with a like water pistol I, th I think so yeah but there, yeah. there's a part where they turn around and the tv's there uh-huh and there's like a i think there's like a football game going on mm -hmm. oh yeah and they're like go, go, go. yeah yeah like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, like for a second there they yeah. just forget their troubles yeah. like they're invested in the hope of like the team winning yeah 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 and then you know they just go back, back to, to reality the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah i thought that's that was interesting like, really i know there's a lot of diversion and one of the critiques that we have that will go, you know, as I said, a lot of this stuff, it probably sounds a bit strange to people who don't share our opinion. We're not saying that we're right. This is just a bit, an obvious opinion. And it's necessary for people to contribute opinions and for there to be conflict and discussion. As Dylan Moran said, war is not conflict, it's the inability to have conflict. Mm -hmm. There's almost not enough conflict or verbal conflict or like proper discussion about different things from different perspectives. And people are very afraid of sharing their perspective. And I'm probably you know, very guilty of uh, self-censoring because mm -hmm. of fear. But capitalism has done a very, very good job in the contemporary sense of co-opting apparently revolutionary ideas into itself so it cannot be critiqued. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be very aware of how ideologically work, ideology works to be aware of the tricks that it is pulling. Yeah. And it's almost why it's impossible to have a complex discussion mm. because things are read into what is being said because capitalism has now co-opted <laughs> what has always been the correct position. Yeah. yeah. So I think what I think what you're getting at is that the difference between there's a difference between what is called now liberalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what used to be the left of the, of 68. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, and like, even in 68, there were critiques of 68. And I'm not saying it's like, you know, it was, sure. it was like a, an upper middle class student revolution. These were like a lot of privileged people. and But often, you know, revolutions do come from kind of a more bourgeois, yeah. you know, it was a bourgeois revolution, whatever. And Pasolini, do you know, uh, died in a really horrible way, um, had his genitals cut off and was run over mm -hmm. hundreds of, well, like 13 times. Um, but he was very much um, of the perspective that it wasn't a working class revolution and that like he came down on the side of the police in 68 because he was like, these are the people trapped within the capitalist system. The poor people who become the police don't have a choice. Yep. Whereas the students, you know, they don't know true. And it's almost true, but like the funny thing is it's like both the students and the police are the victims in the situation. Yeah. I mean. But yeah, no, so to answer your question, yeah, that li 68 liberalism is very different from 2019 quote unquote liberalism liberalism now is all about uh the particulars yeah so the particulars of a specific culture mm -hmm. uh, your sexual preference the color of your skin um your language mm -hmm. all of this like it's been boiled like i don't think that there could be a better sort of uh, bridge mm -hmm. than the one that is between neoliberal ideology mm -hmm. And just liberalism. It's mm -hmm. pretty much the same thing. I know. I think this is it's exactly exactly it, that neoliberalism and liberalism are the same thing now, which is why we would not call ourselves either conservatives or liberals. Because sure. to me, liberals are very conservative because they are neoliberals too. Absolutely. And I think, you know, people are aware that the Democratic Party has and the Republican Party are basically the same thing, but one gives more lip service to certain progressive topics and one doesn't yeah but neither one has the solution so what is missing from the left right well now? i don't well, know if we can even call it the left sure it doesn't even exist doesn't because even, there yeah. isn't some kind of political project mm -hmm. that takes into consideration some kind of universal yeah exactly, uh, and exactly. which which i think that we would agree that that's the working class mm -hmm. uh and the working class is pretty much is taking the backseat to uh, identity 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 yeah. politics exactly yeah um you know and it's difficult it's difficult to parse things out because obviously you know we would be for you know well it's even difficult to say equalities but we're talking about you know universalism yeah and it's interesting i think part of the trick that contemporary capitalism has pulled 
And it, may, it might be slightly contingent on um, generational economics, but there is no 68 voice because millennials are so poor, they can't even protest. Yeah. You know, I do sometimes worry that they're, we have such commodified, politicized, quote unquote, art now. There's no, there's very little, very few radical voices because a whole generation of people can't be artists, can't take a risk, can't live in a squat in New York because they can't, they can't visit a cultural center because they don't have enough money. They're yeah. so hampered by debt that they're not even at zero anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really tragic. And I think that's why we haven't, we, we are now in 2019, kind of post Bernie, seeing, a, seeing some more radical voices. But I think it's an, it's an economic problem, it's such a deep economic problem that there is not even a response. Um, people haven't had time or energy to dedicate themselves to anything other than being a commod, you know, part of the commodified system. Yep. And millennials are almost the most conservative because they are so, so bought into the system. They're so enslaved via debt and credit yeah. that they are so co-opted into capitalism itself. Yeah, it seems like Western civilization is almost just the, the reality of, of our culture is is there because of the repression of the working class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's something interesting that the only way that the working class is paid attention to is by some kind of fetishization of, of, of them. Uh, like if, as if, um, you know, it's this kind of like efficient, pure mm -hmm. progress, mm -hmm. like pure uh pure efficiency and, and dynamic and i think that that's what happens in in live flesh mm -hmm. the working class guy victor mm -hmm. i think he's sort of you know he really is mm -hmm. objectified mm -hmm. nothing wrong mm -hmm. i guess with being mm -hmm. objectified but mm -hmm. uh it almost seems like he's the only character that is like blatantly objectified yeah no it's interesting because yeah he is uh he's like the agent of sex yeah you know it's, in this in this and obviously you know there is this kind of trope of the he's a vessel for like uh davy's uh, libidinal exactly not now like uh, what's the word um he's been neutered <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no you're absolutely right and it there is something uh profoundly patronizing about that and um but he's a vessel of desire he's a vessel of desire and there is kind of a trope traditionally of a kind of a, a wealthy woman i mean titanic is the pure example where she basically has room for somebody else on her, on her, yeah. like, her wardrobe thing and just lets him sink. Yeah, and, and he's like the vessel of her of her um, coming to herself. Yeah, he's a you know. Yeah, yeah. you're right, and it, I do. Yeah, yeah. Elena definitely fetishizes uh, Victor mm -hmm. because he. I'm not like he's. She's obviously scared of him mm -hmm. for most of the movie mm -hmm. until they have sex. Mm -hmm. After like. It, it almost seems like that's the reason why they end up together. Because of it, he's just like... Because him. he's a good uh, lovemaker. Lovemaker. Yeah, and it's interesting. And there is this kind of, you know, the trope of the, like, more earthy, primal people or whatever. And that, yeah, I mean, I think Titanic is just, like, it's pure ideology. It's which, like yeah, a exactly. great film. Which is, that, which is why I don't think that... <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is why I don't think that the end is, is yeah. very realistic. Yeah. I don't think it's meant to be realistic. Mm -hmm. It's not a critique. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, like... I forgot who's maybe it was music, but he says that if Jack and Rose would have mm -hmm. made it back to shore, mm -hmm. fine, the relationship would have obviously ended. Yeah, I know. She would have gone back to the bourgeois family and yeah. like being comfort, being in comfort. Yeah, it would have never worked out. Yeah, and I think that's that's also true for yeah, uh, you know, a realistic, a different yeah. version of yeah. life. Yeah, flesh. Yeah. I don't think that they would it have stayed interesting. together. It's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Um. There was one other thing I wanted to talk about, but we can maybe talk about in in podcasts to come um, about uh, how the kind of the texture of how capitalism has co-opted um, progressive politics from the 60s. Mm. Um, but maybe we should save that for another episode. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds yeah, good. That's true. How, what time are we on? How We've been talking for 45 minutes. Is that is that an episode? 49. 49. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, right. Well, then. All right. Sorry for being long and waffly, but we've been enjoying it. So yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. All right. Okay. All right, See bye. ya.